Hello, everyone. Welcome to Smart Health Talk Radio Show. I'm your host, Elaine McFadden, and we're all about public health. We're about families, communities, keeping things safe, having safe food, water, air, uh, keeping our children safe, um, not only at home, but at school. And we have people that are going to kind of give us the, the down and dirty on what's going on uh, with all these kind of things. A rundown on for 2018 from Dr. Nathan Donnelly from the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, this is one incredible scientist and he is has some really important information. He is also going to, uh, part of his report is going to be on the monarch butterflies. Please go check out bluemonarchproject.com. Uh, we are trying to help save the monarchs and, and some reports have come out uh, that are very depressing uh, on what's going on with the monarch butterfly between pesticides, lack of milkweed that they have to have to live, and the fires. Their numbers are dwindling to near extinction. We need everyone's help. We have a nursery, Blue Monarch Project. Please go check that out. And on that web page, we have information about the pesticides that are being used at your schools, at, in your community. Please check out that information as well, and that's right there on our homepage. Please um, contact us, Elaine McFadden at smarthealthtalk.com or info at bluemonarchproject.com. Find us on Facebook and like us. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Smart Health Talk, and um, that would really help us a lot as well. We could use donations. We're trying to plant more native milkweed. We need pots. We need seed. We, seeds. We need soil. There is a donate button on our Blue Monarch Project website. Um, please think about donating. I, that's what we do, and we have like five, five or six monarchs, I think, that we were born today, and some look good, some not so good. They're not even supposed to be born right now. This is kind of out of the ordinary, um, but we're so desperate for monarchs. I'm doing everything I can to keep them alive, and hopefully something good will happen this year. We'll get people involved. And we're going to go talk to our city councils as well, and we could use some support for that. So please reach out to us, everyone. Okay, we not only have that, we have a report on the monarchs. We have a report from a um, someone, a president from a parent, from a um, local California teachers association. Um, they're undergoing the same kind of spraying that we are here in San Bernardino County, right across the street from our schools. He's going to give us a report Lots of people are exposed when they're at work um, at these school districts, not just the students. Um, they're all affected. And Kath Kathleen Kelly Hala from Non-Toxic uh, Cities, and she is going to give us tips on how we're going to get this done, how we're going to make our communities more safe, um, just uh, all kinds of information. You won't want to miss any of it. So please stay tuned for the whole show, everyone. We've got to line up. Thank you so much. and. Uh, Hope you, hope you walk away with some important information that you're going to take action on and start to improve your own life. And I hope you're going to help us with the monarch butterflies. They're so important and they bring so much joy to our children and inspire them as well. All right, Elaine McFadden here. Thanks so much. Here's Dr. Donnelly. Monarch butterflies migrate north from Mexico every year, and they normally number in the millions. But experts say not this year, because the population is rapidly declining. Meteorologist Sean Stiles is live into Wind and Sea tonight with why there is such a sharp drop off in what's being done to save these butterflies. Sean? Well, Carlo Barbali, this plant is called a milkweed plant or a butterfly bush, depending on who you're talking to at the nursery. Uh, this is the only plant that monarchs will lay their eggs on. It's the only plant that the caterpillars will eat. So you need these. If there's not any of these milkweed, the butterflies, well, they just won't come. I have never seen a natural spectacle that matches the migration of the monarch butterfly. When scientists found monarch butterflies wintering in the mountains of central Mexico, the numbers were staggering. They were estimating that there were some one billion butterflies there. This year there's about 2% of that. The decline has been steady over the past 20 years, but this past season was dramatic. A lot of it's being attributed to Hurricane Sandy, a persistent drought in the Midwest, and the use, widespread use of herbicides now being permitted because of GMO crops. GMO stands for Genetically Modified Organisms. And when it comes to crops, herbicides can be used to get rid of unwanted plants while crop plants are not affected. The monarch butterfly builds its population primarily in the U.S. by its larva feeding on milkweed. 
and milkweeds now being widely wiped out. The monarch's wintering habitat is also threatened. In the year 2011, um, literally half the North American population of monarchs was killed in one night. Ecolife believes that's a result of deforestation from people using wood in their kitchens. When people harvest fuel out of it, it's like cutting holes in a blanket. It allows the warmth to leak out and removes the insulating qualities. So then when they get a big cold rush of weather coming in, instead of the trees protecting them, the butterflies freeze and die. To help the forest survive, Ecolife has come up with a couple ideas. And so we plant as many trees as we can. The second, a high efficient stove that concentrates heat. So you're getting three burners all heated by one small fire. When you make a 60% reduction in their fuel, you're saving a lot of trees. And a lot of butterflies for future generations. We're watching for these amazing drops, these moments when millions of butterflies will flood out of a tree at one time. At that moment, the only thing you can hear is the beating of butterfly wings. and it just has a way of touching you somewhere deep inside. Now we here on the west coast have our own migratory path. The butterflies go up into the foothills here of Southern California and Central California and in the winter make their way back down along the coastline. This is a wintering chrysalis that will be part of that new generation that will start the cycle all over again. We'll send it back to you at the desk. Uh, you know, one. Uh, the, the first question you asked of, of sort of why I, I decided to go into this, um, you know, around the time I was uh, deciding where my focus would be for my PhD um, when I was in school, uh, both my father and a couple months later, my sister uh, were diagnosed with cancer. Um, wow. My father's an older man and, you know, uh, this was sort of not necessarily uh, unexpected, but you know, my sister is younger than me. She was in her 20s, um, uh, diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And so this is this is not normal, you know. Obviously, we'll never know what, you know, contributed or, or caused these things to members of my family. But, um, uh, you know, it just it just got me angry of, of you know, there's there's so much around us that, that we don't know um, uh, how it's interacting in our bodies. Um, uh, and and there's a lot of uh, a lot of interest in not having us know. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of secrecy, uh, a lot of pushback uh, against uh, people who just want the right to know what's in the food that they buy, what's in this uh, hair care product that I buy. You know, what are the risks to me by using this? Because an informed person. Uh, makes often many different choices in their life than an uninformed one. And so, um, uh, moving I forward, love that. I, I love that one right there, Dr. Donnelly. I mean, that's yeah. what we're all about is educating people and making them smart consumers. Because like you said, it's hard, to me, it's hard to protect yourself when you don't realize that you're under attack. Exactly. And, you know, with, with a lot of these long-term chronic diseases uh, like cancer, um, uh, you know, uh, the complexities uh, of how um, uh, these diseases develop uh, really make it so that it's, it's really almost impossible to determine uh, what caused something. And oftentimes it's not one thing uh, that can cause disease. It's, it's many of these multiple things encountered together in our environment. Uh, interacting with our genetics, interacting with uh, lifestyle uh, choices that we make, um, uh, coming together. And, and a lot of times people uh, go through their life without knowing um, their, what they're doing is, is harmful. You know, some things we know about, we know that drinking is harmful, we know that smoking is harmful. Uh, but there are a lot of other things that we're doing that uh, uh, really there's not much information on. Um, and that's frustrating to a lot of people. Absolutely. I mean, it's important to, to stay healthy and, and make sure that we have those defenses when we need them. But, you know, human health and environmental health are really inextricably linked, uh, as you mentioned before. And a lot of these species, like the monarch butterfly and other species that are, are really imperiled, um, are indicator species. You know, they are an indicator of the overall health of our planet and the, you know, the various ecosystems that they inhabit. Um, and so when you start having uh, some of these species get in real big trouble uh, from uh, human actions, um, 
it really can tell us that, you know what, it's really not only these species that are being harmed by this, it's, uh, it's everything. And it's, it's ourselves too, you know, this, um, you know, for instance, with, with the monarch butterfly, uh, pesticides are a real big driver uh, in this decline. Um, pesticides are, are working on multiple fronts. You have herbicides, which uh, kill plants that are um, harming monarch butterfly habitat. Um, it's killing the, the plants that monarchs lay eggs on. It's killing the plants that have nectar that monarchs eat uh, for food. Um, and then you have insecticides, which are, are pesticides that are meant to kill insects. Um, and they are directly affecting monarch health. You have things like neonics and, and uh, other insecticides that uh, really can impact uh, the health of these creatures. Um, and just because uh, a pesticide is designed to kill a plant or an insect or a fungus or whatever the target is, doesn't mean it only affects those, uh, you know, classes of animals. Uh, uh, there are off-target effects that are often found much, much later um, in which, you know, other species of animals uh, can get harmed by different pathways. Um, and, you know, with insecticides particularly, uh, human health is a big, big concern. Well, um, as, a, as a matter of fact, I have a, a milkweed sitting right here next to me that came from my yard. And all those reasons are why we started Blue Monarch Project Nursery, Organic Nursery, where we have organic milkweed. I found out just those very things that you mentioned, the Neonex, um, you know, a lot of the home improvement stores, uh, local nurseries, they're spraying pretty much everything that they sell. And there, there is no place to get um, nectar plants or milkweed plants that didn't have this pesticide on it already. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in the suburbs of Kansas City. And uh, I remember as a kid, uh, seeing monarchs everywhere. I mean, just everywhere. And, uh, you know, my mom's rose garden had a big cluster of milkweeds right next to it. Um, and I'd see these caterpillars all the time. And, you know, when I was in grade school, uh, the monarch butterfly was really the first uh, animal that, that caught my imagination. I just couldn't understand how it could turn from a caterpillar to an adult butterfly. I know, it it so just amazing. amazed me. And it was, it was more entertaining and thrilling to me than any of the, any of the comic books I was reading or any of the alien stories I was reading, you know, it was just so foreign to me. And I couldn't, I couldn't get past the fact that this was a species on the planet that I lived in uh, and it was right there and I could watch it happen. Um, and so that really gave me a huge, uh, profound uh, thankfulness and, and, and desire to be involved in the natural world. And I think uh, kids get that all the time from species like the monarch and, and these other uh, amazing animals that have evolved to do just un otherworldly things, you know. Um, and I think it's important that we have these species around uh, because that's how... Uh, particularly young children connect with the natural world. And that's how I did. Um, and I, I just hope that uh, uh, we'll be able to keep this amazing species um, uh, around so that, you know, my, my children uh, will have the same, uh, the same joy that I did. Also, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you, um, Dr. Donnelly, to kind of explain how these situations, like these big decisions, like a wall, and the environmental impact and like when we're um, giving away our, our pieces of our parks and then um, the way we even do, you know, take care of these parks. I mean, that's coming back um, to haunt us as well. But those are all issues that you guys are willing to go up against. So um, what, what are your thoughts on those? Right. Well, um, you know, there's... There are so many examples of uh, industry sort of bending uh, uh, the direction of the country to, um, uh, you know, increase its profits. Like going back to agriculture, for instance, um, you had, uh, you know, the rise of, of genetically engineered crops in the 1990s, uh, these Roundup Ready crops, um, and farmers uh, sort of uh, went all in on uh a lot of these genetically engineered commodity crops like corn and soy and cotton. Um, and over time, uh, this technology proved to be um, pretty much a failure. Uh, uh, 
weeds have, have developed resistance to glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup um, that people were spraying on Roundup ready crops. Um, and it has made glyphosate and for some, some purposes, essentially obsolete. And so um, instead of our regulatory agencies saying, okay, you know what, this was an experiment. It did not work. Now it's time to uh, look at more sustainable uh, pest control strategies that would offer us a long-term benefit. Uh, agencies like the EPA and the USDA essentially have doubled down on this uh, failed GMO technology uh, of sort of combining different herbicide resistant traits. So you not only have crops that are resistant to glyphosate, but now they are resistant to other herbicides like dicamba and 2,4-D for instance, um, that I would say have much more worrisome health, uh, uh, adverse health prospects than glyphosate does. Um, and you have essentially uh, basically a, an explosion in the use of herbicides throughout uh, mainly the Midwest, but really uh, in a lot of areas of the country. Um, so um, the, U the EPA and the USDA have essentially sanctioned this uh, dramatic increase in pesticide usage that really only benefits the pesticide and seed companies. Um, and farmers are, are essentially forced to adopt this technology at this point. I mean, they've sort of bought in uh, uh, to the to the Roundup Ready trait um, and they, all their equipment and every their whole farms are set up to, to function with these uh, genetically engineered seeds. And so, you know, they're caught in this endless cycle of more pesticides increase increase their their input costs uh and it's it's you know making their margins thinner and thinner and many of them can't you know can't make money doing this anymore um but you know monsanto and and dow and syngenta and these companies are laughing all the way to the bank uh you know they're they're making so much money off this technology it's it's a complete failure um, and it's it's just another short-term Band-Aid fix. It's going to be obsolete in another five or ten years, and then they're going to keep adding more pesticides on top of that. So it's, you know, this is the frustrating thing. But as they've been going through and, and approving these crops and their associated pesticides, uh, the agencies have not been complying with federal law. Uh, they've not been complying with our federal pesticide law, and they've not been uh, doing an analysis on how that herbicide increase will affect endangered species, which they are, have to do under the Endangered Species Act. So this provides a legal avenue for us to challenge these decisions. And I'm, I'm pretty optimistic uh, that we'll be able to, um, um, to hopefully get some, some good court decisions uh, moving forward on this uh, failed uh, attempt at, at increasing pesticide usage. But our farm bill, this is five years of the future for our agriculture. And I just feel like we're just failing with, you know, support of biofuels instead of organic. I mean, and then, I don't know if this is something that you're privy on, but you know, this, you know, how we're spending the farm bill and how, how we're like gambling our money here and our future. What do you think is, what do you think about that? I mean, is that something that you look at, the farm bill and how we're spending all this money? The farm bill is a disaster. Um, uh, I hope, you know, I pray that it does not pass uh, in its current condition. I mean, just, just on the pesticides realm, um, you know, this, this bill, as it's written right now, um, we basically have federal law preempt uh, state and local ordinances on pesticides so that cities like Irvine um, and if some of these other uh, cities would not be able to enact pesticide bans above and beyond uh, uh, the federal uh, regulations. Uh, this would uh, exempt really uh, direct uh, direct spraying of uh, uh, pesticides into water without having to get a permit, um, including sources of drinking water. This would uh, allow uh, pesticides to be approved um, without having to do Endangered Species Act consultation. So you basically approve pesticides without analyzing how they affect endangered species. So it's basically a workaround of the Endangered Species Act for pesticides. So real bad stuff is in there. Um, and this is, you know, all industry driven. They want this stuff. They want uh, no regulations. They want to be able to use to sell and use uh, their chemicals uh, in any way they see fit. 
Uh, and it's ultimately, you know, it's an absolute disaster. And, we, you know, we've got a lot of allies in Congress uh, and a lot of groups working working against this. So hopefully we can at least, um, at the very least, mitigate some of this disaster. Well, you know, you, you say that this is going to stop um, like cities like Irvine enacting their own pesticide policy that says that people within that city have to abide by the city's rules um, related to pesticides. So they see the pesticide industry obviously sees this trend happening because I know there's yeah. been there's been action on cities regarding farming and using GMOs within their um, their areas, particular areas as well, county or city. So, you know, the pesticide industry sees this <clears throat> and they, they want to take away our freedom to be able to pass these laws, basically. Yeah, you know, interestingly, this is all being pushed by the Republicans who are supposedly for state right, states' rights. Um, but a lot of the provisions here uh, actually uh, prevent states uh, uh, from going above and beyond what the feds do, which uh, you'd think would be in direct conflict with uh, their ideology. But apparently, uh, if they are getting paid uh, uh, to have a certain ideology, then, you know, that's all out the window. Yeah. <laughs> that's... Well, you know, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity did an analysis um, and found that, uh, you know, building of the wall along the U.S.-Mexico border um, uh, would impact 93 uh, threatened or endangered species. Um, so this is, you know, there are a lot of species in this area uh, that are already under threat and putting, um, you know, putting a, a wall right, right in the middle of their habitat uh, uh, is going to have huge impacts on many of them. Uh, what would you say to other people out there that want to do the kind of things that you do? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I think the, the best thing you can do is just get involved. Get involved at every point that you can in your local government. Uh, uh, get involved with local city council issues. Um, and just get informed uh, about these, uh, these issues because uh, the more informed you are, uh, the better spokesperson you will be uh, to those around you. You know, whether it's your uncle who you disagree with on these things, uh, whether it's your, you know, um, your brother who doesn't really understand, but he wants to know more. Uh, the more informed you are, the better capable you are of, of informing others. Um, and it's, you know, it starts at that small level, uh, just education, education. Um, and so I would say, get informed on these issues uh, and start talking, just start going around talking to people uh, get involved at, at various marches or um, uh, or events that take place in your local community. Um, uh, get involved with your local school board or city council um, uh, and take it from there. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, Francisco Rodriguez, I'm uh, currently uh, president of the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, and I also serve as... Uh, Vice President with the California Federation of Teachers. Uh, my training uh, is as a special education teacher, uh, and I have been uh, teaching since uh, 1989. Uh, now you, one of the big issues that within your teachers union, um, actually, you know, it impacts teachers and impacts staff and other employees that work at schools and the students. So there's, you know, a lot of times, you know, we're thinking about this, the kids and the students, but we forget that there's other people at the school as well every day, all day. And um, this issue of pesticide drift, which is a very predominant factor in your area, um, because there's so many farms and so much spraying going on, um, you know, this is this is really, you know, nothing new. I mean, you guys have been uh, being exposed to pesticides for decades. So what has changed that is getting people riled up about the spraying next to schools? What what has changed in them? Because even though this has been going on for decades, we really haven't seen this kind of activism of people getting upset. Have they become more educated on the issue, do you think? 
Well, here locally, what has happened is that over the last uh, few weeks, uh, we have had a a number of incidents in which um, that that are very concerning. Um, you know, just a, a couple of examples. Um, one uh, at one of our local schools. Um, it's an elementary school. The teacher, uh, you know, took the students outside, um, it, you know, to the playground and realized that, you know, across the street there's a tractor spraying something, um, and people in, you know, hazmat suits um, on it. Uh, so she. Oh, really? So know, they realized. Oh, my gosh. That uh, there's, uh, you know, there's something wrong here. So she. Um, you know, hurriedly uh, got her kids back in the class and uh, reported the incident. Uh, we had another uh, situation, similar situation, uh, at another school uh, about a couple weeks before that. Um, and so, you know, we we have had uh, here in the uh, Pajaro Valley, um, you know, uh, a number of situations like that that are uh, very concerning uh, over several years. And we have a very special guest on our show today, um, Kathleen Kelly Hala. And Kathleen uh, took on her own community and wanted to make changes in her own backyard, in her own neighborhood. And there's a group of cities, the non-toxic cities. You can find them on Facebook. Um, she's been involved with a non-toxic Irvine, I believe. Um, I have her correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Uh, but, I mean, they've been hugely successful. To have four years' worth of work, working with their city, uh, trying to help them uh, make changes in their system to reduce the amount of pesticides used. So go ahead. Um, Kathleen, and tell us uh, tell us all about what the work you guys are doing and the threats that you're facing right now. Okay, great. Well, thanks for having me, Elaine. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I started uh, years ago in Irvine, and I was very active in my PTA, and I led the movement in Irvine uh, to get these schools to stop using toxic pesticides through my PTA. We went to the school board, and we asked them to stop applying Roundup and all other toxic pesticides, and they actually agreed. And at that point, uh, some other parents came forward, and we formed a group, and we then approached the city. And in Irvine, the schools in the city worked very closely together, and so the city also agreed. It was really a, a nice uh, exercise that we did, and really nice to work with our leaders, our school superintendent, Terry Walker, and city council members, especially uh, Beth Crom, who was on the council at that point, and Christina Shea. They kind of led the way. We met with the mayor. He was Mayor Choi. Now he's an assembly member for the state of California. And uh, the other council members agreed to vote yes, so it was a unanimous vote after our presentation. Um, I've since split, up with, with, split off with the group in Irvine, and I'm working. I'm co-director of Non-Toxic Communities. You can find us on Facebook, and we have a web page. Uh, we've just gotten a really nice grant, so we're going to be upgrading our website, which is very exciting. Um, but we continue to work to share how we did it in Irvine and help other communities to do the same thing. It's always been my dream that if it worked in Irvine that we could share our ideas of how we did it and our experience so that other people could do it in every town across America. And it's actually really catching on. Um, there are a lot of um, states countries, cities who have passed different ordinances and different rules, uh, mostly or there's been a lot of legislation concerning glyphosate lately. Um, I wrote down, I noted it's 24 international countries. We have 21 cities within the state of California that have passed some sort of ordinance to protect either against glyphosate or pesticide exposure for its citizens and especially children in public spaces. And um, 19 other states in the U.S. have some sort of uh, measures uh, to protect children. Uh, the state of New York, all schools K through 12 protect children from pesticides. And in Connecticut, all schools K through 8 have banned uh, pesticide use for lawns. So it wasn't, we weren't the first city to do this by any means, but we might have been the first city or one of the first cities to have 
the uh, regulations completely encompass the whole city, all the parks, all the schools, you know, everything run by the city. And it's been really nice when my kids play baseball now or football, I don't have to worry what they're playing on. You know, I know that the fields are clean and I feel a lot better watching them play and slide the dirt, roll around, whatever happens. Um, I just really am so proud and grateful, proud of and grateful to our city leaders in Irvine for having made these decisions. So um, I'm working now with non-toxic communities and we are a national organization and if people will contact us, we will definitely share information and support your efforts in your town to do what we did in Irvine, uh, passing regulations where the citizens will be safer, especially the children. This whole movement really came about for me and in Irvine, uh, starting with the kids in school, because younger children are more susceptible to these pesticides. And a lot of people don't think about the safety. They don't know that, for example, the EPA doesn't decide whether things are safe or not safe. It's not black or white. I, I used to believe that the EPA wouldn't let anything on the market at Home Depot or wouldn't let our city use products that could cause cancer or, you know, a cause uh, brain damage or developmental damage, but actually the EPA does allow this. They simply calculate the number of acceptable cases of, of injury or death when they decide on the economic benefit of allowing a product to come out on the market. So in general, they are kind of looking at safety, but they will allow products that actually they know cause harm. In fact, the reason products are registered with the EPA is because they are harmful. So we need to kind of change our mindset and all of us need to realize that the EPA is not deciding what's safe and not safe. They're just trying to regulate somewhat the products that are potentially causing harm to a lot of people. So um, without the EPA's really blanket 100% protection, I think it's important for citizens to come forward in each community and do what they can to get their leaders to pass uh, regulations like ours did in Irvine. The I don't have the exact wording of the regulation, but basically what it says is that in all cases, organic methods will be used and toxic products will only be used in cases of emergency. So for example, if there's an outbreak of fire ants or killer bees, or the children are under some immediate threat, uh, stronger products may be used. But I can't foresee any dandelion emergency. So I can't see <laughs> really any case where they would whip out you know, the glyphosate. You could bring in goats. I've seen goats used for controlling weeds on broad hillsides um, and they're using alternative organic uh, OMRI certified products in Irvine that are working and sometimes it's slightly more work. Sometimes they have to apply it twice but it's worth it for the safety and the maintenance guys have said they're never going back. They're very happy now wow. that they've done this and learned so alternative cool. ways and the thing is once you get going in a city it might costs slightly more. I think in Irvine the budget they might have gone up maybe five percent because they made a couple of mistakes kind of with trial and error but now uh, with our water savings which are enormous and uh, the healthier soil which is now pushing out the weeds all by itself uh, they need less product for weed control because everything's just healthier. The fields are spongier when my children run on this field. If you walk on it, the ground is not hard and packed. We don't have bare dirt spots. The grass looks better than ever on these fields. And it's just absolutely amazing what they've done in Irvine. And I hope that every other city will do this. And um, it's interesting. I don't know how many of you have followed the recent trial uh, for glyphosate with Monsanto with the school groundskeeper, but I imagine most of you listening here have heard of it. And during that trial, there was a videotape testimony that was revealed uh, between Stephen Gould, Monsanto's head of West Coast sales, and uh, his chief marketer for California for Roundup, Greg Fermald. And they had a conversation, and they said, uh, or Stephen said, quote, it's hard to understand how against all science and law they can do that, can do this, Fernald responded. We are being led by liberals and morons, sort of like a zombie movie, so we just have to start taking them out one at a time, one at a time starting with the elections next year. So basically what they were talking about was uh, punishing 
elected leaders who made the decisions to protect their citizens. And they wanted to make it illegal to have cities and towns and local governments pass these kinds of ordinances that are more restrictive than federal law. And it's, it's really, there are so many studies coming out, more and more studies. I'll just quote one right now. New York University doctors estimate that pesticide exposures cause an annual loss of 1.8 million IQ points in American children from neurological disorders. And the numbers are increasing. There are all kinds of studies like that from epidemiologists and universities and EPA scientists. And we post quite a bit on our website, Non-Toxic Communities. You can get more information about the, opposing this bill, the specific bill, and also science and scientific studies showing that it really matters what we're exposing our kids to. And children, over 54% of all U.S. children have a chronic health condition right now. So we need to be paying attention to this. Children in classrooms, a lot of them can't learn. They have ADD, ADHD, all kinds of issues that prevent them from learning as well as they could. And they're our future. Certainly for the state of California, I've been up in Sacramento quite a few times and our, our elected leaders say, you know, it's really important to protect these kids because they're our future for technology, for innovation, for everything that made this state great, but also every other state and the nation. We should be protecting our citizens. And, you know, Irvine has dropped all these strong products and these strong pesticides and they're doing just fine in fact everything looks better everything looks better so i would encourage every town to go for this i i, I hope that one person will sprout up in every community and alert others to the importance of this and say you know like our like christina shea said when she voted yes that night uh, at the city council meeting she said why did it take a group of citizens to come forward with this proposal. She said, this is common sense. We already should have been doing this. And it's the truth. It's common sense to protect your citizens. And I don't think that industry should be able to get in legislation hidden in the farm bill that takes away our community's right to protect our citizens. We are at non-toxic communities and we will share with you how we did it. So it was kind of, uh, we'll share with you kind of step by step how you can be successful in your community. And I also want to mention uh, Beyond Pesticides. Beyond Pesticides yes. gave us so much support in Irvine. They gave us a grant for the training so that our guys could learn the alternative methods. And they have all the scientific studies there as well. So, you know, we can help you by saying, you know, how to, but there are other good organizations doing this. Um, and I personally hope to see a lot of other groups sprouting up. I invite other people to either come to us to get support to do this in their own community, or if you're feeling very adventurous, start your own group because the United States is a really big place and we need a lot of people to be aware of this. That you know, my husband was in the bank the other day and his banker was mentioning I don't know how the subject came up, but the banker was mentioning, Yeah, they were spraying Roundup around my condo the other day and I saw a sign and he said, But you know, they wouldn't spray anything that wasn't safe, would they? And my husband said, well, my wife's been doing a lot of work in this, and actually you're not, you're not that well protected. It's good that people are warned, but it would be better if they just weren't spraying it and they were using organic products. That, that's probably something that you're hoping that parents listening to you are having out there, kind of an aha moment. I mean, what would you wish for people listening to you? What would you hope to um, happen as a result of that? I would hope that someone would, would hear me speaking and say, you know, I'm going to start paying attention to what they're applying in my community. And you can ask for lists of what they're applying when and where um, from your school district and your city. They, they need to, by law, give you lists of what they're using. And then uh, form a group and raise awareness. And please contact us at non toxic communities. Well, you we got me fired up, Kathleen. Tell you how to do it. I just want everyone to do it in every town because we need to protect ourselves, our kids, our pets, and there's really no excuse. And what the worst part of this, Elaine, the worst part is that they're using our tax dollars or our neighborhood community fees or whatever it is, however we're paying, they're using our money to apply these products around our families. And I think most people have no idea that they could truly affect the health of their families. So I hope that people will, will start paying attention around their neighborhoods, start by asking the list 
for the list from your school district and from your city. Hey, what are you applying? When did you apply it? How much? Take a look at that and see how you feel. Google those products. Did, did you what, start by going to do. like a school board meeting or a city council meeting? Um, well, I was very active in my school board anyway. I was on the uh, Irvine Public Schools Foundation, which is for fundraising and support of the district. And I was in great support of the nurses. I helped to raise funds to have additional school nurses in our district, again, for children's health. And... Um, I was on that board, so I was kind of connected to people on the board anyway, but even if you're not, it doesn't matter. They have to give you that information. Just call call the district and ask them what they're applying, and, and you know, hopefully you have friends in the community, whoever whoever those friends are, you know, get, get press, get scientific studies, get a group together, and uh, we, we will support you. We will absolutely support you if you would just step forward in your neighborhood and start thinking about this and get other people to start thinking about it too because we should really have more say in how our money is spent. And how our, what our kids are exposed to when they're outside of our care. That's absolutely. what gets me, you know, when the, the school has our kids, they're, they're responsible for everything about our child during that time, what they're exposed to, what they eat. Um, and when they're not, when they're exposing them to something that we would never choose to expose them to at home, that's when I really get upset. And you are so right. People can just get this information and, uh, you know, what, what, what was the thing that you did that you think really kind of got through, uh, to the, the school board or, or the city council to make the moves? To, I, I have that. to say, in, in my case, it was that I was so active uh, with, I was on the PTA board of the city, and I was also on the board of the schools, and so I just knew a lot of people, and I spent two years um, bringing in um, documentation and also speakers for all of our PTA presidents, and I think it was the unanimous vote of all of our PTA presidents asking the district to stop using toxic pesticides around our children. I, for me, that was probably the, the single biggest moment. But you don't need to have that, really. It involves uh, just getting community support, no matter what organization you're active in, or even if you're not or active, just form a parents group or form a citizens group. You don't even have to be a parent of a, a kid in school. You can start just... a Facebook page and start getting people organized. And I think someone mentioned Nextdoor app, which is something that I use. That's right, next yeah. door. But again, if you go to non-toxic communities, we will give you a, a plan where you can right. step by step. But that's how to reach out organizing. after you have the plan and you want to connect with your neighbors and maybe get their support. I think yeah, when you're ready door. to when you once when you're ready to move forward. If yeah, you when you're ready friend, to move forward. I know I know women who are doing this all alone in their towns and they're very successful. My co-director um, Diana Carpanone in uh, New Hampshire, Dover. She does so much in her city all by herself, and she has health issues. She can hardly leave her house. The, the fact is That's true. that the That's EPA true. is behind on all the latest studies. All these studies of epidemiology and, you know, the children's studies and so on that are coming out, you know, repeatedly. I keep getting them in my feed that tiny amounts of these chemicals make seriously damaging effects on our kids. They really hurt them. And they don't hurt just this generation. They affect these children and their great grandchildren. So it, it passes down. So these tiny amounts of chemicals and plastics and different things that kids are exposed to really add up and they really matter. Uh, one of the videos we had on our site in Irvine was um, a study by Bruce Lamphere called Little Things Matter. And if you go on YouTube and you look for the video called Little Things Matter, it explains all of this, really what's going on with our kids. And it's something that's sort of been ignored, kind of this epidemiology. And now scientists are paying attention to it and they're saying, wow, this is really affecting our population, not only now, currently, but moving forward. And everything adds up in our little children's bodies. And a lot of these tests that are done for these chemicals, for these products, say Roundup, for example, you know, someone might say, well, the EPA approved it. But actually, if you really look at it, the approval process is not that strict. I mean, it is on one ingredient. They will test one ingredient. And actually, a lot of the time, the EPA asked the company submitting for the permitting of the product 
for their science that they found. And that's what is happening with this whole Roundup lawsuit. It's being discovered that Monsanto held back all the bad information about the product and <laughs> okay. they didn't even want to test it as an entire formulation because they themselves suspected it, it was carcinogenic so they just didn't want to look at it. But the EPA doesn't test these products in their entire formulation. So basically what's going into your yard is untested as an entire formulation. One of those ingredients was tested, but not everything together. And certainly that's not mine. That's the Roundup mind blowing, they're Kathleen. using plus the 2,4-D that might be in the speed zone that they're using. They're, you know, the combinations of products that our children are being exposed to when they're used together. Um, none of that's tested. Our kids are just the guinea pigs. This affects children all the way up the line, all the way through high school. Because when they're little, it's brain development and other things. And when they're older, it's their sexual reproduction that's affected. So it's, it's a very serious thing. It's extremely serious. And for those uh, areas where the kids are you know, exposed not only in their town or their parks or their schools, uh, not only to those products, but also to the farming products from agricultural fields nearby, it's just piled on their, their bodies. And it's... It's really frustrating because, you know, the Chamaco study shows that this is truly having an effect on the population with autism rates, learning issues, health issues. Uh, it's, it's so extreme for these kids, and it's not one or two kids. And it's, we have staff cool. members that are pregnant coming to work as well. And That's the right. staff members can be exposed for long periods of time because they continue to work in the same place where they're spraying those pesticides right on the campus. And D. Wayne Johnson, who was in the Monsanto trial, that was his job as a janitor at a school campus, spraying. Uh, Dr. Benbrook said it was like poison ivy, but I'm sure they had him spraying weeds and other things as well. Uh, yeah, they, they spray everything with it. In fact, they were using it on the fields in our district and a lot of districts. They burn the lines in the soccer field or the football field. They'll burn it because if they lay down chalk, it doesn't last as long. So then the guy has to go back out and do it again. If they burn it with Roundup, then they burn the lines and that lasts longer. So a lot of districts just burn the lines with Roundup. So your kid's running around on a field that's been covered in uh, Speed Zone, which is the, the, the lawn product that they use, which is 2,4-D, half of Agent Orange. And then the lines that are burned into that same field are Roundup or glyphosate. Can they use like a vinegar product or something else that has yes, a burning effect? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Yes, but it's maybe not quite as powerful. But, you know, the, the thing that I kept saying with the guys that worked in our maintenance department was, is our concern, should it really be whether it's more convenient to kill weeds? Or should we start thinking, well, maybe this product is slightly less convenient, but we're protecting the kids, we're protecting our employees. So that's kind of the thinking you have to... You have to get in. I mean, a lot of these guys are strapped. First, they want to take pride in their work. Um, they've been trained by the chemical companies that nothing else works as well, and this is perfectly safe, and they have their certificate. Um, they're told the EPA approves these things and that anyone who's worried about the dangers of these products is, um, is shouldn't be concerned that this is perfectly safe for the kids and perfectly safe for them. So when you start digging up conflicting science and coming to them, it, it can be a little bit confusing and a little bit discouraging for them because they're working as hard as they can. You know, they've only got so many men on the squad and so many man hours in their budget and so on. So, you know, I would urge people who come forward to bring a change in their community to be mindful of that, that nobody, nobody is trying to, to po poison kids or hurt kids and they've all been taught that it's perfectly safe so it's all about getting them to open their eyes and showing them the more recent science and saying no this truly is a concern and it's worth the effort to change not only for the kids but also for yourselves and your family these guys go home they have everything on their clothes they go in their house they track it in their families are being exposed you know, so many of them that we found when we were watching other cities, we started taking pictures and seeing guys, they wouldn't wear gloves and always wear goggles or boots, you know, they were very casual about it. They just 
really were not concerned about the safety of Roundup. And I would say I'm thankful for this lawsuit. I'm very thankful for the lawsuit that came forward. It did expose a lot. And uh, it did go out over Bloomberg. And it was on the major networks somewhat. But not as much as it could have been maybe. But it's it still went out like a blip. And hopefully more people are waking up. And within the communities of these these workers who are applying these products, I think that word is spreading. I think word is spreading. And it might be a good idea to contact the radio station. There's a radio station that uh, all the Hispanics in the state, way down in New Mexico, listen to. I can't remember the name of the program, Elaine, but you could look it up and make sure they're talking about it. But, you know, Bloomberg was talking about it because it's such an enormous lawsuit. And the, the problem is that Bear has taken over Monsanto. So now, essentially, Bear's going to have to pay these these, for these lawsuits, and there are thousands more. This was only one lawsuit. There's like 8,000. <laughs> the interesting thing is that the California judge was really sort of against um, the, the attorneys in this case, and she let very little of the evidence be submitted, very little. But in a federal case, from my understanding, a lot more of that evidence will come out, and it's even worse than what the California jury saw. So going forward, I hope, I hope there's justice for these, these poor people who were told it was perfectly safe. And, you know, in the meanwhile, there were people inside Monsanto that, that knew it might not be. But if you want to learn more, I highly recommend you look for the book, Our Stolen Future. You can find it on Amazon, use copies, pick it up, or, um, or watch the video um, uh, by Bruce Lim, Fear Little Things Matter. And it really explains how all these little things that kids are exposed to is really affecting their health as well as ours. So it's just time to think about it. And it's time for each of us to go to our community leaders and say, hey, I'd rather you use safer products. It, it's not a radical thing that we did. I mean, it shouldn't seem that way. You know, it should seem like common sense. It's like our city council member said, you know, why weren't they already doing it? Why did citizens have to go forward? But the truth is that a lot of people still think the EPA decides whether things are completely safe or not safe, and that is not at all the truth. Well, well, how you say that they only tested one ingredient when, I mean, has anyone like even estimated how many ingredients are in Roundup? I mean, it must be like, it's like something like a hundred, I think, or... I know that Professor Seralini tested it for the additional toxicity, the toxicity of the entire formulation. I think he said it was a hundred or a thousand times more toxic than just glyphosate. Really? I'd have to look. I'd have wow. to look at that study again. Yes, but wow. yeah, like exponentially times? more toxic. And this is that's just looking at Roundup. That's not even looking at all the other products on the market. The EPA only looks at the one active ingredient, and then they decide whether, well, if it's going to cause cancer in a certain number of people, uh, how many people do we think is okay? you know, relative to the benefits, say, of agriculture or the economic benefit. And it's kind of like a balancing act for them. Um, it just isn't, it, I wish it were more black and white. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I'm Elaine McFadden. Hope you find us on BlueMonarchProject.com and on social media and subscribe to our Smart Health Talk YouTube.